All right, we're here again, episode six. And today I'm going to be going to Silverstone Racing Track. Um, I'm going um, to see a competition, an engineering competition called Formula Student. And what that is effectively is a design competition undertaken by students in their third and master's years of engineering degrees, typically. And they're tasked with creating a single seat of Formula car to compete against other uh, international universities. So there's usually around 100 entrants from all over the world, even as far as Australia, India, Pakistan, Egypt, and all the European countries. It's held internationally also, but at the moment it's the UK competition, so it's at Silverstone. It's the Friday, which is the scrutineering and practice days. And I'm actually going with Race Car Engineering to write a future article with them about the technologies that are brought to form a student. The regulations, um, while they hold safety as a paramount, otherwise they're fairly free. So you see cars with really aggressive aerodynamic packages and you see some cars with no aerodynamic packages. You see internal combustion engines, electric Formula Student cars, and there's even now an artificial intelligence and driverless version of the competition. So it really brings out a lot of great ideas and showcases, again, kind of coming off the last video I made. It highlights the creativity and innovation that students really have and the passion that they have for engineering. So what I want to accomplish with this video is to introduce you guys to the competition, have a good look at what some of the teams have brought from a technical side, and it really varies quite wildly. You get um, teams that are less familiar with the competition that bring relatively simple cars right to the other end of the spectrum, active suspension, hydraulically decoupled suspension, the complex aerodynamics and electrical systems. So I hope to catch some of those and show you what the competition is about. So now let's do a bit of analysis on some of the technical side of the competition. The tech most readily on display, I suppose, is the aerodynamics. So you can see from these pictures that some of the cars have really quite complex aerodynamics, whilst others choose to move away from aerodynamics and just attempt to maximise the mechanical grip of the car. The range of complexity within the aerodynamic packages of these cars varies quite a lot. So let's have a look at some of the more complex cars and break down what exactly it is they're trying to accomplish with each. So the first car I'm looking at here is the entrant from Moore Racing, which is a university collaboration that are based in Modena in Italy. And they're one of the more well-resourced teams. So they've arrived with quite a complex front wing. They've got side pod aero, big rear wing and a rear diffuser. I'm also seeing some vortex tunnels, um, which are in an attempt to control vortices interacting with the flow fields at the end of the front wing and on the sides of the underbody. So starting from the front of the car, let's work back and see what they're trying to do here. So the first thing you'll see there is a three element front wing and the main functions of that wing are obviously to generate downforce, but being at the front of the car and the first flow device encountering the airflow, the front wing is also responsible for downstream airflow and how much energy is taken out of the air, how much turbulence is generated, which obviously then affects side pod aero and the air onto the rear wing. So one of the major tasks there is to divert the oncoming air over the open wheels, which are a large source of lift and drag, and induce turbulence on downstream flow. You can also see how the end plates are diverting air laterally away from the tyres. And also you have these aerofoil sections right on the end plates too. It's hard to say exactly what these are doing, but there's almost certainly some kind of flow control function and an attempt to steer the air away from where it's harmful and towards where it's beneficial. There'll also be a little downforce gain there. What you can also see is underneath those four mini aerofoils, there's a tunnel. And what that tunnel is trying to do is catch any vortices that are coming off the underside of the front wing, which will then interact further down the car with the underbody aero. Those vortex tunnels also feature on the sides of the underbody. And that's to ensure that the low pressure generated there doesn't spill out and doesn't draw air in from outside, which would then raise its pressure. You can also see some airfoil sections on the sides of the side pods. They're also quite significantly angled, which means the resultant of the force that they generate is gonna be more in the longitudinal plane rather than the vertical plane, which would indicate that they produce quite a lot of drag. But given that the quality of the air at that point is gonna be far from ideal, I think that's probably a design that they had to go to to get any meaningful downforce at all. Moving further back towards the end of the car, they've also got an engine cover, which some teams do have and some don't, but the function of that engine cover is going to be to reduce drag 
and also clean up some of the air for the rear wing. Normally the area behind the driver is left exposed, which means that oncoming air has to travel over the air intakes or the engine accessories, creating a whole lot of drag and furthermore disturbing airflow that the rear wing is going to encounter. You can also see a rear wing in the diffuser there. The diffuser helps to expand air coming along the underside of the car, acting to further reduce the pressure on the underside of the car and draw more air in, creating more downforce. The rear wing you can see has a variable section and that is, I would assume, to maximise the varying airflow that the airfoil encounters along its section, ensuring the most efficiency along its length. Also, something that's quite not usually seen on former student cars is the louvres, which further help to increase the efficiency of the wing. And talking to this team, they were telling me that at approximately 80 kilometres per hour, which is 50 miles per hour, the car's generating around 1,300 newtons of downforce, which is about half the car's weight, so it's quite substantial and above speeds of about 120 kilometers per hour or uh, 75 miles an hour the vehicle can generate more downforce than its weight so even at the slow speeds of this competition these aero packages are actually generating quite substantial force and will have a big impact on the dynamics of the vehicle throughout the rest of the competition looking at some of the other teams all their approaches are generally trying to achieve the same thing with varying amounts of success of course but one thing i did notice is that across all the teams the top scorers all had aero packages. So despite the drag penalties and the weight penalties, it's definitely something worth doing. As far as powertrains were concerned with the competition, there was a choice of internal combustion engines using traditional gasoline or E85 fuel, or battery electric vehicles driving either two wheels or four wheels. So with the organizers wanting to keep uh, power limits under control, they would limit the internal combustion engines to a 20 millimeter restrictor and the electric vehicles are limited to an output of 80 kilowatts. So what I saw at the competition was a mixture of those two. Most of the internal combustion engines were driven by small motorbike power units. So a CBR 600 four cylinder engine, for example, is a quite a common choice. So with the internal combustion engines, a lot of the innovation was focused around the intake and the intake plenum and also the exhaust and exhaust headers and all the components like that with intake systems ranging from high-tech 3d printed plastic parts to carbon fiber parts and even just plain steel welded parts similarly with the exhaust there was a lot of different routing and header lengths and all that kind of thing in an effect to optimize the, where the engine power was produced within the speed range and lastly with vehicle dynamics which is the one that usually catches me the approaches were again quite stable and the majority of the teams would use between 10 and 13 inch wheels to keep rotational mass down, an equal length double A arms um, to give a large amount of kinematic control of the wheel, push and pull rod operated dampers, which move that assembly out of the airflow and off of the unsprung mass onto the chassis. And speaking to more of the well-funded teams, that's where the stuff started to get exciting. For example, some of the teams located in mainland Europe, such as uh, Zurich, TU Graz, Ren Team Stuttgart, they had the opportunity to do things like decoupling chassis modes. So they would have separate heave springs for each axle and a center element that would control the roll of the vehicle and really optimize the mechanical grip. Usually you only see these things in high-end motorsport, so it's really quite exciting to see these on student-developed cars. So it was a pretty gray and rainy day today. It wasn't so much fun being outside. And as usual with scrutineering, it's always a, a panic and a chaos as you're told that you need to change things and modify things to make the rules. So I couldn't get hold of all the teams that I wanted to. But nevertheless, it was great to be back and see what some of the teams were bringing this time. The competition doesn't allow racing, but what it is is scored on a bunch of static and dynamic events. The static events are things like um, design judging, cost efficiency scoring and the completion of a business plan which is something that potentially you would present to investors. And the dynamic events are an acceleration test, a sprint around uh, an autocross style circuit on the Silverstone track, an endurance event, and incorporated into the endurance event there's an efficiency, um, which rates the fuel efficiency or, or rather energy efficiency of the teams and the cars in the competition. But I did this competition in 2013 when I was a student at Sussex University and it was really hard and exhausting but actually one of the best experiences i've had as a young engineer it's a really good introduction to motorsport 
and I learned lots of useful practices and ways of thinking that I still apply to my career today. So it's a really great thing to be involved with. I would encourage it to anyone who's considering a career in engineering if you have that available to you. So I hope you enjoyed seeing some of that. The next video is going to be coming soon, so keep in touch.